It is uh, an honor for me to be here with you. Uh, this is a, a, a special uh, webinar uh, for the for the uh, SPS, the nonprofit management. Uh, for us, uh, he, it has been something pending. Uh, having a, a, a series of, uh, of uh, webinars, uh, how to start uh, a nonprofit, how to effectively uh, begin to operate a, a nonprofit organization, a mission based organization. And uh, we have been discussing the way to, to do this for, for a while. And, uh, and Cindy has been moving all the, all the contacts and, uh, and came with this idea. And I believe that it's a, it's a perfect opportunity. Uh, for a uh, sharing uh, some of the good practice, sharing what is the information available, uh, how it's uh, the the financial, how the fundraising operates. Uh, it is it is a good opportunity for uh, uh, talking about uh, the nuts and bolts about uh, incorporating and operating an, a nonprofit organization. So uh, a series of four events that uh, it's gonna run uh, from now to February next year. Uh, for us, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And, uh, and also uh, for us, it's an opportunity also to continue uh, building a more uh, a stronger family and a stronger network uh, among all the people that is uh, or a SPS and nonprofit management from uh, upcoming students to uh, the, the alumni to the professors to the current students. We have a, a strong community that we want to uh, keep uh, a stronger uh, and uh, in given the opportunity of this event. Uh, today, uh, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a, the first part of a, of a series to learn more about how to start an organization, how to manage an organization, how to uh, be more effective in terms of fundraising and governance. Uh, this, uh, this event today uh, will give you the, the opportunity also to see uh, how to apply uh, for the the nonprofit, uh, the tax exemption, uh, filling the the 1023, the 1024, and how to maintain also that that, that status. We have a different events. Uh, we have a, a, an event about uh, also effective fundraising with the John Hex. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity to learn new tricks, new tools, how to be more effective in terms of fundraising, how to also develop your fundraising plan, uh, how to have a, a different a, a, a strategies behind uh, the one of the most important part of an organization that is having the funds to operate. Then we're gonna have uh, a Saturday, uh, January 30, uh, with uh, uh, Bernetta uh, Walker, a wonderful opportunity to learn more about governance and the, the duties and the principles and how to uh, be more effective in terms of the maintaining the hard core of the organization, maintaining the mission and how the role of the board and the role of the whole organization in terms of governance. And of course, uh, it, 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 it won't be a, a, a full a program without talking about marketing, communication, impact. Uh, it's the art of communicating, the art of having a, a, a marketing strategy. And uh, we, will, we will have a Tom Watson also participating as a, as a or, or guest lecturer for that webinar. So it's a full uh, series of events. I hope that you will be able to participate. I hope that you will be able to join us for uh, all these uh, uh, webinars. My, uh, my name is Carlos Ponce. I have been working in this sector for almost 30 years. Uh, working with international organizations, so with uh, a, I was the, the head for the Americas for Freedom House, uh, managing 
proposals, projects, uh, uh, compliance, uh, uh, dealing also with fundraising uh, reports, also have been helping uh, numerous organizations to uh, in their process of incorporating the organizations, uh, applying uh, for the five, uh, the, five uh, the, the, the non-profit uh, tax exemption status, uh, helping them to comply, to develop their strategies, helping some organizations with uh, strategic planning, uh, also have been teaching uh, uh, governance, uh, uh, managing uh, the organization, managing the mission base, uh, leadership, uh, have been teaching also in other universities. Uh, I have been managing also projects with the U.S. government, uh, European Union, and uh, and it is a long uh, time uh, working with uh, with different organizations in the in the nonprofit sector. I have been learning several tricks, several tools that I have been applying, and I have been sharing that with uh, with the students and with other organizations. Uh, it is an honor for me to be here. With respect to of our uh, conversation today, uh, it's gonna be, a, we're gonna record the, 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 the whole webinar, but uh, we're gonna edit the, the webinar uh, to use all the, the information in the, in the future. So don't worry about your uh, privacy, you will be a, a protected from uh, from uh, any 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 situation so we're gonna edit all the webinar uh, my goal here is to uh, engage in a discussion uh, in an open discussion during the the presentation I'm gonna uh, begin the presentation and I I, I will uh, stop uh, my presentation in uh, uh, several opportunities to give you time, to give you the opportunity also to participate, to send your uh, questions uh, uh, through or or a uh, board or uh, directly. You can, oh, I'm going to open the mic for you. You can raise your questions, your comments, and uh, then we're going to continue. I don't want to talk for, for two hours in a row. I want to, for you to, to have this opportunity also uh, to uh, ask me or comment about uh, something that you uh, think that is interesting. I also have a couple of cases that we will uh, talk about during the presentation. Uh, we also share with you some of the uh, materials, some of uh, the readings uh, the, the, that I, I, I believe that they were uh, important uh, for you uh, before this presentation. And this PowerPoint presentation will be available also uh, for you. Uh, my my style, the way that I work with this PowerPoint presentation, that PowerPoint presentation that give you all the, the, the information that you can use this anytime. And, uh, and probably uh, you can also look in the future for some specific information that probably you will need to use in case that you want to open uh, your mind and uh, begin to uh, incorporate uh, a nonprofit or, or work in, uh, in a nonprofit and you will be uh, challenged by, by the need of uh, uh, a, a maybe submitting an I-90 or, or a legal framework that you need to have uh, into, your, uh, into your tools to be more effective in terms of the operating of a nonprofit. There are numerous nonprofits in our, in our sector. There are numerous mission-based organizations, 1.8 uh, organizations uh, a, that include churches, that include a 501c3, 501c4, a community service, homeless shelter, a college or universities, unions, uh, a student uh, fraternities, uh, a credit unions, member associations, environmental associations. There are numerous organizations uh, uh, that uh, actively engage a contributing with society, contributing with the community, contributing with the, the mission, contributing with a cost, with a mission. And uh, this is important because it is a, a strong base 
for participation, a strong base for support, for sharing also with the community, and also to contribute uh, in a better society. So this country is one of the countries with a more active uh, uh, nonprofit sector, mission-based sector, and uh, people contribute with the, with the sector directly, donating money, donating service uh, uh, as volunteer, uh, it's a, a sector that is uh, always active in any crisis, and we saw that during the, or we haven't seen that during the uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis, the sector has been there supporting the community, supporting the ones uh, they in need for support. Uh, in terms of a, a nonprofit, there are several uh, moments in the life of, uh, of a nonprofit. That's what uh, uh, we call the life cycles of a nonprofit. From a startup, that's what we're going to concentrate today, is when you begin to operate, you begin to make the, the initial decisions. It is the right time to incorporate. It is the right time to apply for a tax exemption. It is the right time also uh, for me to engage in this kind of, of process. Uh, what is going to be the board, the initial board, the, the knowing about the, the laws that apply to the sector, uh, thinking about the structure, thinking about the governance, thinking about all the, the, the initial questions that you will have in mind then the, the organization uh, continue uh, to grow, continue to learn, continue to improve over the time. And it becomes a uh, adolescent that uh, is an organization with a, a better structure, uh, with more clear uh, objectives, with some uh, clear activities, engaging in a, in a, in a more in deep work uh, to fulfill the mission and uh, to serve the community then the organization begins to uh, continue the, the, the growing process, improving, maturing, an organization that uh, a, a, a substitute the, the funding board for a more governance board, more structure, more monitoring, uh, a, a board that oversee the, the whole organization, an organization with uh, a strong programs, a strong fundraising, uh, with uh, uh, leadership, uh, uh, and also an organization that also include uh, different strategies in terms of the way that the organization operates. And that is the time the organization will have a challenge to innovate, to renew the organization, to review the mission, to engage in strategic planning, to see the future, to envision what is there for the organization. And uh, if not, the organization will die or uh, dissolve because uh, over the long term, the organization, if they, the, the organization is not updating the, the way the organization operates, uh, suddenly the organization uh, will suffer because other organizations, we talk, uh, we uh, uh, see that uh, we have 1.8 million organizations, there's a competitive market there. And it's always like that. I include here the difference between each one of the organizations uh, a life uh, uh, stage and uh, you have uh, uh, the first thing that's one we, we're going to talk today. It's uh, the key question that you're going to have in terms of, of incorporating, in terms of creating a nonprofit. It is possible, my dream. Uh, what do I need to include in terms of programs? Uh, what are the funders? Uh, uh, and the funders will be involved in the, in the operations of the organization. The, the board will be involved in the operation of the organization. You normally uh, your money is in kind, is uh, volunteers, is, uh, except for some organizations that begins to operate with a grant or with a, a, a promise of that grant or with uh, some specific donation for a specific donors. There are some donors that decided to help a specific group to uh, create uh, a nonprofit. So sometimes there are nonprofit with better luck than others. Uh, no programs, no fundraising, no monitoring available. So it's the beginning of the beginning. So how is the, the incorporation process? Um, there is no, uh, uh, the process is not uh, black and white. Uh, first, you have to define uh, what is your cost, why you want to do this, uh, what is the idea, 
uh, what you have in your mind, how you're going to contribute with society, how are you going to change the situation of that community, how are you going to engage directly in something that's going to be productive. So thinking about the, the idea, framing your idea, uh, sometimes it, it's thinking about how this is going to contribute with the community. Uh, after that, you have to review what is there. You have to uh, engage in a market approach. I'm going to talk more about the market approach in a few minutes. But how are you going to deal with this? How, how are you, how you going to uh, engage with the community? Who else is there? Uh, there's another nonprofit doing the same work. Because if there's any other nonprofit doing the same work, maybe your best alternative is not to uh, go to the process of creating a nonprofit and incorporating the nonprofit and applying for the tax exemption. And maybe the best uh, alternative is, uh, is trying to figure out if you can join the effort of other nonprofit or other groups that have been operating and improve that group. Uh, if you have a, a, a local nonprofit and you want to share your idea, maybe you can get a compromise that they're going to allow you to also implement your idea with that organization. So you will have the better of both worlds because you will continue uh, engaging in what mm, you think that is unique for the community, but also you don't have to deal with all the, the, the time consuming and, <clears throat> and the effort about um, incorporating, creating, and managing an organization. But if the organization exists, but uh, you don't have any, any, any chapter in your community or it's a national organization without uh, a, a, a strong uh, network and probably they don't care about your community or even though they operate in, in your area, they don't care about your idea, they don't care about your, uh, your offer to work with them, uh, maybe uh, your best approach, yes, is to create a nonprofit. Then, if uh, you decided to create a nonprofit because there's no one else there, uh, your market approach uh, told you that yes, it's the right time to create this nonprofit, that you have something different. Uh, and you can contribute with your community, you can contribute with society, you can contribute with your beneficiaries, that's the right time. Or if there's no one else doing this, probably that's the time uh, to begin to think about uh, creating a nonprofit and not necessarily incorporating the nonprofit. There's a, a, a difference between working in the community and maybe creating a group that doesn't need to be incorporated to participate in the community. If you need to have a, an organization that will require to open a, a bank account, to pay, uh, to, to rent the space, to do other kind of operations, yes, you will need to incorporate and you will need to move there in, in the process of incorporating the organization. So the first thing that you can do is first uh, evaluate it, uh, what is gonna be the, the cost, what is gonna be the, your, your, your objective uh, behind this organization. And maybe you can think about a theory of change. So you can focus in what is the problem that you want to solve and how you uh, plan to solve that, that, that process. Uh, I always recommend that uh, uh, th within theory of change, but also uh, doing some environmental scan. That means uh, reviewing what you have, uh, your uh, internal analysis. So if you have specific donors in mind, if you have uh, specific skills that will help you to operate, if you have a group of people that are gonna collaborate with you as volunteers, if you have uh, the space, if you have uh, different things, what, what is your strength? What, what, why you are different than the rest? why you can also be successful. And, and what else are you gonna bring here to be different than the rest of the groups? And also, uh, if you are, are, are weak in certain areas, your weakness, uh, I always recommend the strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats in different stages of the life of an organization. At the beginning, it's a good tool to use. Identify your strengths. Then probably you don't have enough funding 
probably you don't have enough uh, knowledge about a specific areas, how to manage the organization. What are your weaknesses? So you have to reflect that, but also evaluating the market, evaluating what else is there, evaluating if there's a priority for working in that area, evaluating who else is operating there. How effective is that organization? If there are other alternatives there, what are the risks about engaging in this? What are the risks about beginning to operate in a COVID-19 environment? There are several risks of operating right now, so you have to take everything into account. You have to take, a, do you have a, a, what it takes to compete with bigger organizations that operate in your sector? Or you have the ability to compete with for profit that probably are doing the same more effectively. You need to evaluate the market. It's a market approach. And normally when you read any book, uh, they say, well, directly incorporate a nonprofit. No, my, my approach is think about that. Think about what you're gonna support. Uh, think about the process. Uh, think about uh, the, the whole environment. Do this environment to scan is a good uh, uh, tool to use uh, when you just begin to think about a, a, a creating a nonprofit. And probably this is gonna tell you, no, this is not the right time for you. Probably you don't have what it takes right now. Let's wait or let's uh, wait for a better opportunity. After you, this, uh, you do this uh, environmental analysis, my second recommendation there is that you uh, begin to think about your stakeholders because your stakeholders will be there for all your consultation, will be there for all uh, your planning, will be there also for fundraising, for crisis management. It will be good from the beginning to think about the initial map of stakeholders. So you have made your donors that you will approach uh, beneficiaries because uh, my advice is that also, if you have a community in mind, such a beneficiary uh, a community in mind, begin to ask them their priorities, how they see uh, for you to engage with them. Maybe you will include some of them in your board. So you have to think about your stakeholders. It's a whole universe. And remember the difference between, uh, one of the difference between a for-profit and a non-profit, that the, 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 the for-profit, uh, normally they, they, they have shareholders. Uh, for the nonprofit are uh, stakeholders. So this all the community, your donors, the authorities. But my advice is that you need to think about uh, how you're gonna relate with them. And from this universe of different stakeholders, evaluate also the power level. So the ones that you need to have in mind all the time and begin a consultation process with them. And then of course, selecting a name. So after you know what is the purpose, after you know what is the area uh, that you're gonna engage and pro the community, begin to think about the, 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 the name because you're gonna need the name in the incorporation uh, process. Then of course, it's governance. You need a board. It's, uh, if you're gonna incorporate the nonprofit, they're gonna require for you to have a board. They will, they will require that you need to have a board, that you need to have a secretary, you, you need to have that as a uh, part of the incorporation process and also as part of the governance. So your priority is to begin and, and look for the best people to serve in your organization. And initially it's a, a foundational board that will be also operating, that will be taking care of the, the, the bylaws, the policies, the, uh, the mission statement. Also it's a, it's a, it's a board that's gonna engage in the in hiring process, in defining the planning. It's gonna be a board that's gonna be involved in several areas. And this board will need to mature over the time. Of course, uh, uh, you need to uh, be as inclusive as you can. Uh, uh, this board needs to have uh, different elements in place that you're gonna see more about this element in the governance uh, webinar, the governance session, probably uh, she's gonna cover all of this. So I'm not gonna spend more time uh, uh, talking about the board, but it's important that you have in mind that that's on a priority and there are different kind of board. There's, uh, you have to think about the board that's gonna serve your organization, the type of organization that you are planning to incorporate. 
think about the kind of board that uh, will uh, be there for you and uh, the structure of that board. The board, they are more hands-on with the organization. It depends if your organization uh, will have some chapters too. There are different kinds of structures in terms of the board and in terms of your priorities uh, for that board. Then you have to begin, you already have a board, you already know that you're gonna continue the incorporation process. Uh, and you need to think about the mission. Of course, the mission can be reviewed uh, after you have a more clear environment uh, to operate, but you at least have to have an initial mission. Why it's important? Because the mission is the center of your organization. Uh, one of the key uh, uh, statements that an organization uh, has is the mission. The mission define the organization, not only because it's, it's, it's cool, it's nice to have a, a good mission, a short and a mission with, uh, with strong impact, it's because you are a mission-based based organization. That means that your tax exempt status depends on that mission. Uh, and uh, your uh, uh, organization need to adjust this mission if anything change. And uh, in the strategic planning process, you review the mission and, uh, so, so, and uh, from time to time, it's the role of the board is, is also reviewing the mission. This is short, it needs to have impact. Normally, the recommendation is less than 10 words that will uh, uh, show the, the, the vision where the organization uh, needs, to, needs to be in, in several years, where, where the organization needs to move. Uh, you need to, to think about the ultimate purpose of your organization. Uh, if everything is perfect in 20 years, how are you going to fix, how are you going to solve the problems of that community? What is going to be the impact that you want to uh, leave in, in, in your lifetime with this organization? A, without a mission, it's impossible to talk about a mission-based organization. It's impossible to talk about a, a purpose. You need to have that mission to support the work that you have, and also a, a vision. Those uh, having the values, the vision, the governance, that's important. It is important also having a, a, a good, a strong mission because you will need the mission in your branding strategy. And obviously, when uh, uh, we cover uh, marketing and, uh, and, uh, and communication, uh, you will know more or you will uh, uh, get more information about branding. But branding will help you to have a, a better view of how the organization uh, will uh, develop its communication and marketing campaign and integrate in the mission. That's why it's important from the, from the beginning to care for the mission and having the mission in mind all the time. And, and also uh, the unrelated business, remember in terms of taxation, and we're gonna talk more about that, you have also unrelated business. That means that sometime if you don't care about the mission and somebody figure out that your organization is doing different activities not related to your missions, that's unrelated business and subject to taxation. So it is important, the mission. Uh, so this is the time, the key time, after you evaluate uh, the purpose, after you evaluate the community, after you figure out what you want to do, it's just the time to think about, uh, uh, it is the right time for me to incorporate or I prefer to operate in the community with my volunteers. I'm not gonna receive a penny from, from donation. I don't need a bank account. I don't need anything. So I can operate and fulfill that mission in my community without the need of having a structure, an organization. That is good. That, that is a possibility. And several organizations operate that way. Several mission-based structure operate that way. They just operate in the community and they don't need that structure. But if you need the structure for legal operation for business, you will need to begin the incorporation process. We enter when you begin the incorporation process, it's not about going there. Well, I want to incorporate a, a nonprofit and I want to incorporate uh, an organization who will serve the community. You need to think about your alternatives. And now that the, the environment is more competitive. And the, 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 the innovation is there for, for the uh, also no, uh, nonprofit sector, for the mission based sector. There are several uh, for profit that have been including 
uh, a, a purpose uh, for those organizations and they have been changing also the structure and they have been sharing also. It's not only about the, the message, they also have been using part of the profit to invest in, in the communities. So you have several alternatives. Uh, to, to, to decide how it's going to be your organization. From a, a mission state based perspective, having a 100% a a charity based organization that's going to work in the community, a 501c3 that's going to work on, in a community, or 501c4 that's going to be uh, more advocacy, more oriented uh, to deliver a message. Uh, you have private foundations, uh, you have uh, uh, organizations with membership uh, that also generate their own income, a uh, civil league. So you have the whole spectrum there from the, the less active engagement with the mission and applying that to the community to more hybrid models, to more uh, uh, business uh, for profit uh, models. You have some hybrid uh, nonprofit. Uh, of course, you have unrelated business. Uh, you have to take into account that. Mm, sadly, the the IRS is not updating uh, the, at the same level that we have been innovating in this sector. But you have different options. Then you have social expert, uh, enterprise. Uh, uh, opportunities, some labs, some uh, uh, mission business base, or L3C, B Corp. There are several business operating as, as, as B Corp. Uh, and they have been very successful. Uh, and, and they have been delivering also a good message working with the community. So your only alternative probably is not uh, a, 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 a incorporating a, a nonprofit. Probably you have other options there. And even in the nonprofit world, in the in the in the nonprofit world, you have different alternatives in terms of the incorporation process. So it is, as I, as I told you, not black and white all the time. Then you can have uh, purpose-driven uh, organizations uh, a, with a charitable structure, even with hybrid uh, a, a, a models in terms of governance with some a, a shareholders, some a stakeholders incorporating the community. So it has been changes. There are more and more and more innovation in, into our sector. So you have to think about uh, this legal structure. You have to think about it, how it's a nonprofit. Okay, I prefer because I have a faith in my community. I want to work. I don't want to make a profits. I just want to have enough to, to live a decent life and contribute with the society. I, I don't need to uh, be greedy about this. And I believe that I have a mission in my life. So I have uh, the option of a legal structure that can have hybrid. Uh, they are uh, for profit and nonprofit at the same time. LLC, charitable LLC, several uh, 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 rich uh, uh, entrepreneurs has been preferring using this uh, uh, formula uh, to contribute with society because they keep control of their funds. They keep control of the structure. Uh, social incubator labs and the traditional trust, 501c3, 501c6, 501, the 501c uh, sector. And then you have the for-profit and the different alternatives in the for-profit sector. You decided to go and move to the 501c3, 501c4, the, the nonprofit, a charitable LL3. So you have different alternatives too. You have public charities, foundations, social welfare, a professional trade organization. If you want something more uh, challenging and in terms of innovation, now you have the, the LLC structure, the charitable LLC structure that allows you to keep control of the organization. Uh, it's an it's a, a organization that looks more as a, as a for-profit. Uh, uh, all the uh, uh, members are uh, uh, sometimes a, a tax a exempt when the objective, when the activity, when the investment is tax exempt. Uh, you can have additional tax uh, deduction. Uh, it's it's uh, an opportunity also to uh, uh, control, have 
uh, privacy. Uh, remember, as soon as you incorporate uh, 501c3, it's not your organization. There's something that I repeat all the time when I receive questions, how I can incorporate my organization. No, 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 it's a public charity. That means it's a public. Uh, the 990 are public, the information is public, and it's not your organization, it's an organization. So the, the LLC gives you the opportunity to control more flexibility and, and also control your assets all the time, the money that you want to uh, use for this. Uh, uh, Zuckerman opened his own uh, uh, LLC, charitable LLC. This is a figure that has been uh, there. There's also low profit liability companies. There are several options that you have there. You defining a, the, the, the whatever is in your mind. You have to think about the structure. You have to think about how to operate and what is best for you. So not a one size fits all. So you have different authority. Uh, after you move ahead and, and think about what is your, your uh, a, a structure a, and how you're going to operate and what is the, the need that you have in terms of, of the organization, a, you need to begin to draft your bylaws. Why? Because the, the, in the corporation process and also in the, if, if you apply for a 1501c3, 501c4, uh, or, or apply for a tax exemption, they're going to require this. And you need to have a, 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 a legal a frame for your organization, legal structure, defining a, a key questions in these bylaws, a, a name of the organization, where you're going to operate, the purpose, the limitations, a, the structure of the organization, how the board is going to operate, if the executive director will have a voice and a vote in the meetings of the board, a, the officers a, view uh, what kind of committees uh, you're going to have as a governance structure, the dissolution clause that's going to be required by the IRS, that all the funds needs to be a, a donated to another a, organization a, if your organization a, it's finished its operation and the dissolution. Uh, also, that you are a tax exempt organization, that you're gonna you're not gonna distribute any any profit among the members of the organization. So you need to have this legal uh, framework as a as a way to operate your organization and be more effective. You need also to begin to think about other things. You need to begin to think about different policies that you need to have. Uh, thinking about the the compensation of the board. You're gonna compensate the board or not, and some state uh, prohibit uh, any compensation to board members, uh, all the compensation, all the conflict of interest policies, uh, the budgets. You begin to think about all of this. Uh, you need to also think about the structure, how you're gonna structure the organization, the board, how it's gonna operate, how the board is gonna function. And, and also, uh, you need to, if you decided to follow the path of a, of a, of a, a tax exempt organization, what kind of organization do you have in mind? Uh, it is important for you because as you can see, uh, there are numerous uh, categories uh, in uh, the publication 557 from the IRS, and each one of these categories is different. If you have a 501c3, uh, it's tax exempt, but also the contributions uh, from anyone are tax deductible. So it's a good thing because uh, you can uh, uh, send the or a determination letter to any donor and they can use that as a way for a uh, uh, tax deduction. It's not the same with, uh, with other kind of organization, 501c4 or other clubs, they, they, they can not uh, have the same uh, uh, advantage. After you have that, after you decided what kind of organization are you gonna incorporate, it comes to the incorporation process. And it needs to be in, in your state. And whatever you want to operate, if you want to operate in New York, if you want to operate in, uh, in Massachusetts, in Florida, uh, you have to review the, the, the specific rules, the specific regulations of the specific state. 
every state is different or a different process in every state. And, and you have to check that. For example, in, in Massachusetts, it's, it's immediately, you go online, you uh, fill the articles of incorporation, apply, pay, everything in the same uh, in the same process, in the same moment. So you can do everything at the same time. In New York first, you need to verify the name, you need to reserve the name, uh, you need to uh, uh, decide what kind of, of, of corporation are you going to incorporate. Then you begin to, if you're going to operate in certain areas, you need to uh, apply for specific approvals at state level. And, and then you begin to process and pay for the certificate. And, and then you apply for the tax account uh, in New York. Uh, for all this process, in all the states, no matter what state uh, you are or where you're going to apply, you need to have the articles of incorporation. Normally, you have some articles in incorporation online, and you just need to feel that. You need to, to feel the paperwork. But you have to have in mind what kind of board uh, you have, the name of the members of the board, uh, the type of organization, the, the mission of your organization. All of that need to be there, uh, some address. Uh, you need to have a, an agent in the specific state. That is, uh, that's going to be required in all the states, that you have an agent in that state. The one's going to be responsible in front of the state of the operations of the organization. And of course, you need to update these articles in, of incorporation in, uh, in, uh, according to the changes in the specific state. I uh, included here in the presentation the requirements in, in New York, uh, the type of, of uh, uh, incorporation that you can have in New York. Uh, also, I include some uh, forms there for you to have an, a, a clue about how to uh, incorporate your organization in New York. Every state is different. There are states more uh, uh, more advanced in terms of the implementation process. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, normally it's uh, seventy-five dollars, and you have you have different uh, states and uh, different requirements in every state. In New York. Uh, used to be by fax or in person. They have been changing that doing to, to COVID. In some state, they, it's only by fax. I don't know how you can find a fax. I, have that, I had that discussion uh, with uh, uh, the with Secretary of State in, in Massachusetts uh, because some of the documents need to be uh, in person or by fax. I told him it's impossible to find a fax now. Do you need to adjust that? But the adjustment process takes some time. Uh, okay, let's stop for, for, for a minute here and give you some time for Q&A. I see that I have some questions here in the chat. Can you give some highlights of Family Foundation and the grow into the donation? Uh, well, this, uh, those are foundations. Uh, those are foundations. The foundations, the different uh, between the, the the public charity and the foundation is uh, you have difference in terms of the board structure. You also uh, have the different in terms of the money that you allocate to the foundation as part of, of the the contribution of the the family to this uh, to this foundation and and also the endowment that you create and how you invest part of the endowment and the benefit the interest of that endowment in the community. Uh, uh, can you do this yourself or you need an attorney? You can do the, uh, everything yourself. Uh, I, you don't need an attorney, it really, it's, it's very simple. All the documents are very simple. Uh, everything is online. At the beginning, you don't need a complicated uh, bylaws. Uh, you can uh, copy some bylaws that are available. I included a, 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 a form uh, into the, the materials about bylaws. It's uh, easy, easy to follow uh, steps. Uh, and you have different uh, uh, web page right now that uh, with information about bylaws, about how to write a, 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 a compelling mission. Uh, and and uh, uh, online uh, uh, state uh, application process is very simple, very simple. Even uh, the form, the, the, the form is online and you just need to fill that. 
it's more complicated when you get into the process of uh, uh, applying for the recognition of your status. Why is applying for the recognition of your status? Because you automatically, it's, it's Congress, the one that uh, guarantee your status. What you, always, uh, you do is, is, is uh, asking uh, IRS if you uh, have all the requirements to be a tax exempt organization. For the, 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 the 1023, 1024, and the other forms to apply for that, it's more complicated, but not impossible. It's a straightforward feeling blanks and uh, feeling that takes more time and, and sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, more bureaucratic, but you can do that by yourself too. And you can apply, everything says online. And, and I have to be honest, the IRS has a, a really good uh, web page with good information there. They have been including also videos, informational videos and how to apply for the whole process. How long, uh, we're gonna talk more about the, the 501c3 application process in a minute. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, there are more and more collaboration. That's why my, my, my initial approach is that the, the you need to collaborate uh, initially, you probably, need, you don't need to even to incorporate your own nonprofit. And yes, uh, it's just getting to a point that you need to uh, look for more collaboration in the sector. But what I mean with, uh, with com competitive is because you are trying to get into a, into a, 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 a competitive uh, environment in which several organizations are operating. And uh, if you want to incorporate a new organization, you need to evaluate the environment. You need to evaluate if you have something new, something different that will make a, a something a, that will have some relevance for the community, for society, instead of, uh, of, of just uh, creating something else there that probably is not going to be successful. Uh, yes, we have uh, a 1.8 million uh, organization and several organizations incorporated every year, but several organizations die every year and die because of lack of funding, because weak missions, uh, lack of interest of the members. There are several reasons uh, why the organizations uh, fail, and sometimes uh, lack of governance. There are different reasons, but uh, the best approach sometimes is as soon as you have an organization, you can, you can begin to operate uh, the organization and be successful. Uh, um, okay, Let, let's see, let's see, I'm going to continue with the rest of, of the questions in, in a minute. Uh, this, I included in, in your reading this case study, that, that's going to give you an idea. In this case, uh, Sarah uh, and Ellen, uh, they decided to, uh, they have a, an innovative way to, uh, to contribute with society uh, because uh, they have a, 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 a way to, uh, to create, to produce low uh, cost uh, nutrition bars that will uh, solve a problem of the lack of vitamins and minerals of some people in some communities in need. And uh, they, they believe that that is the right time for them to create a, a, a nonprofit, to, to incorporate a nonprofit. Uh, this kind of benefit, this is an innovative process. They believe that they have something different there. Uh, they will uh, contribute with appropriate nutrition. They're not thinking about money. They are not, a, 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 they're not engaging in a, in a profitable business. What they want is to uh, contribute with society. Uh, Jim uh, told, an old friend told Sarah that the best approach is creating a nonprofit of their own and, uh, and a, a tax exempt organization will help them with grants and uh, fulfill the social goals, and, but they don't have any idea. Uh, probably after this uh, uh, lecture, after this webinar, uh, they can have an idea how to move forward and, and incorporate their own, uh, when, I incorporate a nonprofit, not their own. I incorporate a, a charitable organization. And uh, there's uh, also a professor uh, from Ellen that told her that LLC will be better because they're going to have the flexibility uh, of a, a nonprofit. Uh, uh, 
uh, having the for profit a mine and a structure and, and preserve the, the control of the organization. Uh, they ask for the advice. And, and in this case, uh, according to what we talked uh, recently, uh, the first thing that they need to, to do is, is a market approach. The first thing that they need to do is not thinking about the structure and how they're going to uh, operate, is thinking about what else is there, if somebody else is doing that. And maybe the best approach for them is looking for an organization that's already working in some communities and offer them this innovative approach and reach an agreement and collaborate and begin to uh, and not having to deal with all the administrative, financial, all the structural problems that represent uh, incorporating and operating and managing a new uh, organization. Uh, and probably that's the best approach. And, and finding another organization that will allow them uh, to operate. In terms of the structure, uh, there have been so many uh, uh, articles uh, uh, challenging the 501c3 sector because it's, uh, it's too close uh, to innovation. I don't think that way. You have universities, you have uh, uh, healthcare centers, you have a, a whole universe of organizations operating on their 501c3 uh, status, and they have been operating freely. So it does not necessarily uh, uh, be a, 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 a something that is close. Yes, you can apply for grants Having a uh, not having a 501c3, a grant is different. A, uh, you can apply for a grant. There are different ways of uh, uh, contracting uh, in terms of the federal government or uh, in different ways that people donate. Uh, you can you can donate for a, a innovation lab and, uh, and not necessarily, and they can have some grants. They can have some grants also for individuals. So not necessarily the grant and the, 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 the uh, tax exempt status go by high by, by, by uh, hand by hand. Uh, uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the rest of the of the of their business uh, in terms of uh, of this operation, if they see that they really are unique, probably, yeah, there's the opportunity for them to think about uh, doing this. But um, my advice in this case is to evaluate the market, evaluate what is there, evaluate what is the, the requirements, and, uh, and evaluate if somebody is doing something uh, uh, like this. This is the certificate of incorporation in, uh, in New York. As you see, it's very simple. It's just filling the blanks. So you don't need a lawyer. Uh, for the question about the lawyer, you don't need a lawyer. It's something simple. In every state, it's almost the same, simple. Uh, it's online, and you can feel that. Uh, and, and also, uh, it's, a, it's a document that's uh, a straightforward. So let's, uh, let's uh, continue, and let's uh, going to answer uh, additional questions uh, later. But I, I just want to continue with the presentation and uh, and uh, and getting back to to uh, to the nuts and bolts about uh, the implement the uh, uh, applying now for the tax exempt status. Okay, what is what is uh, the the tax exemption? What uh, those tax exempt means? So it's it's simple. It is uh, a, you don't need to pay taxes as long as the uh, revenue uh, that you receive as as long as the income that you receive is related to the mission, and that's why uh, sometimes we see that universities doesn't need to pay taxes for tuition, uh, and that's an income for service uh, that healthcare centers. 
receive uh, a payments uh, for service and you don't have to pay income. Of course, there's a lot of critics uh, from the for-profit that uh, is competing in several sectors. But remember that uh, a nonprofit uh, is supposed to be more efficient and invest directly uh, into the community. And uh, since uh, the profit is not the, 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 the main interest of the organization, tends to be more efficient in certain areas. Uh, there are other organizations that doesn't need to apply for the 501c3 like the churches because of separation of church and state. And churches are, are, are a particular uh, uh, type of, of, of organization. Uh, the the uh, faith-based uh, organizations has been applying uh, and moving to be more in a way of churches because it's, it's more, uh, they don't have to feel the 990, they don't have to apply for uh, the 1023, uh, they don't need to uh, engage uh, with, the, with the IRS, but if they want to rent space, if they want to operate, uh, they at least need to incorporate the church at the state level. So what we have been talking so far, apply for the churches uh, in terms of, of uh, incorporating the church at state level. And that's why New York and other states, you have the difference between uh, the, the mission base and the faith base of so the churches and the, and the charities are having that difference in terms of the uh, incorporation process. But for the, the tax exemption, the church doesn't need to uh, apply for anything. The church automatically, same with state and local governments. Uh, you have uh, the tax exemption only when it's related to the mission. So it doesn't apply for other kind of activities. We're gonna talk about a little bit more about unrelated tax exempt uh, 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 activities that needs to be taxable, that needs to uh, reform and you need to report uh, to the IRS those uh, uh, activities and that income as different income that received the organization. Uh, then also, uh, we're going to talk more about this. You also need to collect the, the FICA tax, Social Security, Medicare. Uh, you have to uh, retain uh, employment, withholding uh, employment salaries uh, for taxes, uh, unrelated business income, unemployed uh, taxes, among other taxes. So that doesn't mean uh, being a, a tax exempt organization doesn't mean that you are exempt of everything. Probably you're gonna be exempt from uh, income uh, taxes and some state and, and local uh, taxes, but not uh, from uh, some specific uh, uh, related to labor and other taxes that you need to collect as, a, as, a, as a any, any employer. Uh, now let's go and move to the nitty gritty of uh, applying for your tax exempt status. So if you decided that uh, you wanna move from being uh, just uh, incorporating at state level, and you decided to move uh, beyond and apply for your uh, tax exemption. The application process first, you need to apply for an employer identification number. So it's, it's an employer identification number. It takes about five minutes or less. So you go online, include uh, select that is a, a nonprofit, uh, select uh, the, the, the name of the nonprofit, you include the name of the nonprofit, and uh, you're going to receive a PDF a document immediately after you fill the documents and it's gonna pump it in your, in your screen and you will have the unique ID for the nonprofit. It's something very simple. It takes five minutes and you will have that. That's the first document that you need. Then you begin the application process. And the application process depends on the type of the organization. Uh, you can have some uh, civic organization like 501c5 or the 501c6 that you use the 1024 form, or you have the 1023, and there are different forms 
the, the, during the time, it has been uh, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, critics uh, against the IRS because of the uh, complicated process and, uh, and because the time the IRS takes into reviewing the applications and in uh, and, uh, and, uh, sending the, the, the determination of the ruling to the organizations. And uh, because of that, and because the majority of the organization are small organizations uh, that make less than $50,000 per year as a volunteer based organization, there are different uh, uh, forms that you can use to apply. If you have a, a, an organization and you believe, you believe that you're going to make, you're going to receive uh, a more than $50,000 per year, or somebody's gonna donate a building to you. And, uh, and, uh, and you believe that in, in your lifetime, uh, in your organization, uh, you're gonna make more than that. You're gonna, you're gonna uh, need to apply for the 1023. Uh, I'm gonna cover this in, in, a, in a minute. Then you have the 1023 EC, it's an organization that will make or making less than $50,000 per year. And, uh, and this is an easy one. This is online. You feel all the paperwork online. Now everything is online, to be honest. Uh, uh, from this year uh, and, and uh, in the future, you need to fulfill all these documents, to fill all these documents online. The 1023 used to be a mail-in, but now it's online too. The 1023 Easy uh, has been uh, online. It's, uh, it's uh, something that came uh, like 10 years ago or, or more uh, to help small organizations to apply. And to be honest, uh, when, when uh, I apply for the first time in helping an organization uh, to apply for the 1023 Easy, it took about a uh, couple of days to receive the, the, the determination of the ruling letter. Now it takes uh, seven months. And, uh, and for the 1023, the, the regular 1023, sometimes a year, it's supposed to be 180 days, but in some cases, it's more than a year. They don't have enough staff. They don't, and now with COVID, it's worse. So in, in for that application process, with the first one, it's going to be $600, the application uh, uh, fee. For the 1023 EC, it's just 275 and it's on, uh, both are online now. Uh, there's no difference in terms of that. Uh, after you apply, you submit all the documents. Uh, my advice is uh, submit that at once as soon as you incorporate the organization. But you have some time. You have 270 days to do this. And uh, you, you will have a presumption. I'm going to talk about the presumption in a minute. Uh, but you have all this time, and you can fill this, and you have the opportunity to apply and you decide how much are you going to make. And according to that, you use one uh, form or another, or if you have a civic organization, apply with the 1024. You only need to apply once in your lifetime, except if the IRS rescinded your status because you're lost uh, your mission, because you are not uh, a working as a, a, a nonprofit, you are more for profit, or maybe because of probably 80% of your operations are more for profit than nonprofit, or maybe you forgot to submit your 990 reports for more than, a, for more than a three years. Then you have uh, a, a ruling determination letter uh, that will uh, tell you uh, first, yes, uh, uh, this is a determination letter. From uh, now on, you are a 501c3 and uh, you are a tax exempt organization, and you're really happy about this. You're really happy about the, the, the possibilities of. Uh, Apply, of, of uh, working and uh, and you begin to show that letter to everyone. Uh, you can have a denial letter because uh, the structure that you selected because of lack of some documents or lack of some uh, important information and you never submitted that information when they asked for the, the, those documents 
or because uh, there's a conflicted uh, information about your organization, maybe you are trying to incorporate uh, a, an organization that is uh, uh, not a US organization in uh, whatever is the cost. There are several cases and they ended in court and they ended in fighting and also for innovation in terms of the structure of the organizations. So we are a, there are several, several things that you need to have in mind a, after you apply because you probably will receive a letter from the IRS asking for additional questions. A, a, they uh, ask you about uh, a, the structure of your poor, uh, if you have a web page, if you a, a have a, 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 for example, a whistleblower policy, whatever. They, they can ask you several questions. And that, that's the tricky part. Because sometimes I, I have been helping several organizations with this, applying with the 1023, and after waiting for one year, suddenly the organization received this letter asking for more information or asking for changes in terms of some documents, asking for changes in the bylaws, asking for changes in the uh, in in the hope uh, whatever is in 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 their mind and i have been receiving that and uh and it's a challenge so that you end up talking with the with the specialists and trying to figure out and it used to be only for the 1023 and now with the 1023 easy uh, an organization that i helped to apply a, a couple months ago receive also a call from the IRS asking for additional questions. It's supposed to be a, a simple process. Now it's taking months to. Uh, then uh, you apply, you receive your letter, and, uh, and then it's time for reporting. It's uh, if feeling the, the, the 990, 990 I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, this in, in, a, in a few minutes. So here you have all the information, how you're going to apply, uh, how you're going to receive the determination letter, uh, the 1023, the requirement for a 1023, the fees, the EC, the 1023 EC, uh, it's easy to apply. Then you have the 1024 for civic organization, and then you have the 1024A for welfare organizations. After two, you incorporate the organization, you have a, a legal presumption that you fulfill the requirements established by Congress. Remember, it's not the IRS the one to this, the one who decide if you are or not a tax exempt organization. It is a it is a directly your right as an organization if you fulfill all the requirements. So there's a legal presumption from the moment that you incorporate, that you show your will to, uh, to be a tax-exempt organization, you have 27 months from that day to the day that you fulfill all the paperwork, the 1023, and you are tax-exempt, as there's a presumption there. And what happened if they deny your status? You are in a deep, deep water. Why? Because you have to review all your, your tax report and change that. And, and instead of that, begin to pay your taxes. You, if anyone contribute with your organization uh, during that uh, 27 month, and suddenly you are not a tax exempt organization, uh, it's not tax deductible. So you need to begin to call every donor and tell them, hey, listen, I received a denial letter. I uh, appeal that and, uh, and I lost. So it's not a, a, a tax exempt organization anymore. So you will need to review also your taxes because you cannot claim my organization into your taxes. So it is a pro. But you have this, you have this time uh, to continue operating, 
you fill your 990 uh, every year, uh, you open it as a, as a, uh, as a, a tax exempt organization, you also uh, have this presumption that from the day that uh, you incorporate the organization, from that day, you became a tax exempt organization. If you miss the 27 month to apply for your 2023 or 1024, that presumption ends and your tax exempt status begins from the day that you apply for the tax exemption. It doesn't make sense. One is automatically, as soon as you incorporate, you have 27 months to submit all the paperwork to, a, to the IRS. It can be the day 10 or the day uh, in, in the last day of the month 27. And you're going to be a, a tax exempt from day one, from the day of you incorporate the organization. You also have the option of applying for expedited a service. So ask the IRS that you have a compelling reason that you need the uh, uh, evaluation, you need the, the letter as soon as possible because you have a pending grant that needs that letter for that grant and you have to explain that and, and that's going to have an adverse impact into your uh, organization, probably you are applying for federal grants, you are applying for USG money, and you need to submit the 501c3 letter of determination. So you need to have that letter. You have to need to, uh, to submit that with your application. If that is the case, you can explain that, prove that, and probably the IRS will review your documents in advance and not waiting for a uh, one year or the 180 days that they say that uh, it will take for them to review that and i'm uh, 180 days uh, never in my lifetime but whatever that's what they say uh, you also have a an organization that provide a disaster relief uh, you decided to create an organization now to deal with the with the uh, COVID-19 effects in certain communities. You can apply for uh, expedited processing. And if the IRS mistakes cause uh, the delays in, uh, in your determination letter, maybe the IRS didn't review a document uh, in, uh, in the proper way. Maybe you submitted the documents and the IRS lost the documents. So you can apply for the, this expedite uh, process. So after you have that, you have your incorporation. You have a, your uh, a 1023 or 1024, a, the 1023 a EC or the regular 1023, you apply, you have that, you have everything ready, a, you have all your documents, you are ready in terms of the legal a, a structure that you need for incorporation and for applying for the tax exemption. Then you begin the operation. You begin the operation and, uh, and you have a, a, the time to apply for state uh, and other permits to operate. There are some organizations in the healthcare uh, business or in other areas that needs to uh, uh, be engaged directly into other uh, permits to be more effective uh, operating the state. You also tax exemption for the state. You need all, all other permits in terms of building, whatever permits you need, you need to begin to think about those permits. It uh, begins with the, uh, all the administrative mechanisms, uh, begin to think and, and board liability and uh, insurance issues. Remember, uh, you are liable, your board is liable. So you have to think about this, uh, planning, and adapting uh, your nonprofit, probably after you engage in all this process, uh, you had six months or so to think about uh, your work. You have more connection with the with the donors. You have a clear map 
about the, the, the environment, and you have a, a clear opportunity to, uh, to, to, to see the, if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the organization is in, in the right time. And, uh, and of course, you begin to develop the plans, you begin to develop your, your uh, monitoring evaluation plans, you begin to uh, think about the strategy, uh, reviewing your mission. Uh, this is the right time to review your mission and uh, after you connected with the community, because initially the documents uh, uh, that you uh, probably include in, in your uh, in your incorporation process, they, they were draft documents. Uh, the, the bylaws, it was a draft document for the bylaw. It's a, a, and now it's a time to review everything. It's time to begin to, to, to think about fundraising plans. It's time to begin uh, 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 to improve your governance, to improve your marketing, to improve uh, uh, the, the, the structure of the organization, to be more clear. Then you have to uh, follow the law. You have some, some rules to follow. There's a, a, the mandate to keep the records, the documents of the organization. Uh, you also need to fulfill the, the state and local uh, solicitation rules. There are some state, there are some communities, uh, some local governments that require for you to uh, apply for a permit to uh, any charitable uh, activities, so any fundraising activities, you need to apply for a general permit. Sometimes it's a general permit or a specific permit. In some states, it's mandatory. In Massachusetts now, it's mandatory. In New York, you have to apply to uh, ask for money in that specific state. And normally, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy document. You need to begin to think about the whole world of a successful organization. You need to begin to think about governance, how you're gonna structure your governance, how it's gonna be your leadership, how it's gonna be your fundraising, how you're gonna create innovation in your fundraising, how the internal process, how you're gonna improve that process, how it's gonna be effective, how it's gonna be your narrative, your storytelling. You have to begin to think about that. You need to begin to also the process of planning, planning for the future. Begin the planning of the structure of the organization. Begin the planning for the future of the organization. Where you are, your mission, your strategy, the, the initial programs and service, the leadership of the organization, what is your mission, your goals, and where you want to be. That's the planning, so where you want to be. And how are we gonna get there? How is gonna need to improve the certain areas? I need to improve uh, the, the, the actual uh, commitment of the organization, my fundraising plan. Uh, you need to begin to think about oversight as a priority uh, because you need to be uh, responsible for the money that you will receive. So it begins to create your monetary and key fi financial indicators, uh, create a control mechanism internally in the organization, begins the oversee process, approve the budget, the initial budget, uh, begin to work in all your financial documents, uh, all the rules, the, the system, the process, uh, your, how it's gonna be your reporting, your internal and external controls, the co documenting system. This is important because there's a law that requires for you to keep those documents and have a policy in place for, for those documents. Then you need to begin to think about your plan. How is gonna be your strategy in the future? How are I gonna get there? How are I gonna get from where I'm, uh, the organization is right now in, the, in terms of a, a, a basic organization that you just uh, incorporate this organization and what you want to be in terms of fulfilling that mission. So you need to begin to, to, to develop those, those strategies. Uh, to begin to think about uh, maybe how you're gonna get there. Uh, what are the strategies that you're gonna follow? What is gonna be the program strategy? Begin to think about the programs that you want to implement, the programs that you have, the funding that you have, what you're gonna do, what is gonna be the strategy for those programs? Uh, what is gonna be the organization strategy? How are you gonna uh, follow your dream? How are you gonna follow that 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 path that are gonna drive you, you close to the, to the mission? Uh, how is you gonna fulfill those objectives? You have to think about that. This is a perfect time, again, 
for strength, trend, weakness, opportunities, and threat. So now you have the organization, and now you have to think as an organization, how are you gonna get to the, to the point that you want to be? And you also need to uh, improve your leadership internally. How are you gonna structure the organization to have a better leadership? Begin to improve the technology, branding, uh, and how you're gonna uh, sell the organization outside, your risk, now with COVID, risk uh, management is more important than, than before. Revenues, fundraising plan, and having all the palette of different uh, uh, resources that you will approach, how you're gonna uh, 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 reach the, the, the donors, what kind of strategies are you gonna implement, how you're gonna apply. You need to develop that plan, you need to develop those strategies, begin to think in a plan, in a fundraising plan, in a revenue strategy, how you're gonna get the funders to operate, and how it's gonna be your marketing communication strategy. Your organization is moving. The organization, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's now a, a, a wonderful organization that's contributing with the mission, but you need to think now in compliance. How you gonna continue? How you gonna fulfill uh, the legal requirements? How you gonna uh, be sure that your organization is uh, uh, fulfilling the, the, the law? and uh, uh, fulfilling your uh, labor laws, st state law, legal compliance. And then you have to care about your 990. Yes, you got your 990. But if you forgot about uh, submitting the, the, the 990, yes, you have the tax exemption, sorry. And you forget about uh, uh, submitting your, your 990, you're done, you're done. You're gonna receive probably now the, the IRS is, is sending letters to uh, uh, for you to remember uh, if you uh, fail to submit a 990. Sometimes you do uh, submit the 990 and my recommendation is you, you keep a receipt. Probably it's not gonna happen anymore because it's gonna be online and you're gonna receive an automatically receipt that you submitted the 990. But that because until uh, this year, it was uh, a, a my mailing for small organization, except for organization that makes more than 500K mailing process, uh, now it needs to be online. So all the organization has been receiving uh, a communication from the IRS telling that now uh, uh, from, from this year and uh, the, in the future, and all the organizations need to uh, submit their 990s uh, report uh, or online. That is perfect because now the IRS will have the opportunity of uh, putting all these documents uh, available for the general public. Remember, the 990 is a public document because it's a, a public charity. That means that anyone can read your 990. Anyone can see what's going on in the organization. Uh, you have to keep your uh, withholding, your FICA taxes, uh, your uh, maintaining your, your uh, W2, uh, also uh, fill the, the quarterly report, the 941 that you report how many people work there, and you report also, you uh, 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 report how much you have been withholding in terms of FICA taxes and, and retentions to, to any employee. Uh, of course, you need to continue focusing the mission because you can lose your status if you lose your mission and having your conflict of interest uh, policy in mind. I was telling you this about the the, 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 the the interest in the public and the documents that the public need to have. Normally, uh, you want to be as, as open as you can because your uh, uh, goal is to be transparent and to show that, that you have a, a what it takes to manage uh, the money from others and uh, manage the trust from the public, the trust from the, from the community. And so you want to be public in terms of the information, but remember, the 990 is a public document. 
And the IRS has been improving the 990 over the, the, the last uh, 20, 20 years. I remember my first 990, it was shorter, less information. Now the 990s include a lot of information about the owners, about your programs, about your objectives, your activities, your board, uh, because the public need to know about this and need to know about your organization. And there's a public inspection about your 990. And, and if you pay salaries, uh, if you have any any contractor, and if you any operation more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you have to include that. You if you have you pay more than fifty thousand dollars to any 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 members of your staff, uh, the gift that you receive, uh, itemized and contribution that more than uh, five thousand dollars, that needs to be in your nine ninety. It's a public document, and all the information needs to be there. And there are several organizations reviewing the 990s and uh, in doing some watchdog uh, as a service uh, for uh, our sector, for our community. Then you have some employment uh, responsibilities, uh, legal responsibilities, some uh, tax withholding, and FICA taxes, uh, future taxes in some states, uh, and other uh, employment verification for uh, people who will be uh, legally able to work uh, here in the US. Uh, you also have the opportunity, sometimes you have an organization uh, and you decided to uh, incorporate other organizations because you have some specific tasks that you want to tackle or you want to have an organization as a, as a, as a the organization that represent uh, uh, a group of, of organization in the same sector or a national organization with chapters. So you can have a group exemption. What it means is that one organization can have the, the, the exemption and transfer that to the rest of the organizations. It's just one 990 who's gonna include all these organizations. Uh, remember, a tax exemption is not a, 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 the, all the contributions are tax deductible. You need to be a 501c3 to have the tax deduction. A, you need to meet those requirements. A, with respect to this 990s, a, the 990s also has been changing over the, 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 the last uh, 20 years. A, all, again, a lot of complaints about the, the, the long 990s. In some cases, like Columbia and, uh, and major uh, mission-based organization, it, it's uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, that the 990 takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. You have people working in this for, for months to fulfill the, the 990. And because of the complicated of the 990s, the IRS has been moving uh, in uh, creating uh, different uh, uh, forms for different kind of, of organizations, just according to the to the income of the organization, to to the gross income of the uh, previous year, uh, you have a series of 990. Uh, and remember, these 990s are tax report. There's no tax form. The organization is not paying taxes. You're reporting to the IRS and to the public for them to know. They have the right to know. So you have to include all the information. You have to be in compliance. This is the opportunity for you to prove that you are in compliance, with compliance with the law, that you have an active board, that you selected the board in, in a proper way, that you are active in the community, that you are delivering some service, that you are uh, in line with the mission. This is a time uh, to, to prove that you, uh, and, and also to report if there's an investment, if they, there's a, a loss of, of part of the capital of the organization, loss of some assets, this is a moment to report all of that. And it's, it's, a, 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 it's a requirement that you report everything in the 990. There are, there are different 990s. There are different 990s. It's just according to the size of the organization. Again, small organization, the one that I told you that can apply for the 2023 EC and having that application sooner and a small organization, volunteer organization, if you make less than $50,000 in the, in the previous year, 
and you uh, have normally that's a gross receipt of fifty thousand uh, dollars or, or less uh, you can uh, feel something calling the postcard it is uh, online it takes probably 10 minutes to fill this, give you uh, 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 answering uh, some uh, easy questions, and immediately you fulfill the requirement because you are making $50,000 of less. You don't need to inform about the donor. You don't need to include major information there. It's, it's an easy way uh, to report back to the, to the IRS. Then you have the 990 easy. The 990 easy are organizations with gross receipt uh, under uh, $200,000 and assets under uh, $500,000. What does it mean that if you have a building and, and the value of the building is uh, uh, $600,000 and you made in a gross receipt for the previous year $20,000 you will need to use the, uh, the traditional uh, 990, the full 990. If you, uh, your assets are uh, less than, than $500,000 and uh, your uh, gross receipt were under $200,000, you can use this form. It's like eight to 10 pages. It's easy to fill. It's online. Now you have to, uh, to, to uh, uh, deliver this online. You can use some uh, a, a, some a, a specific programs to work in your form, but it's uh, it, you have to deliver that online. But you have to deliver the form, the PDF form, uh, online. Uh, then you have the traditional uh, 990 organization that uh, uh, had gross receipt more than $200,000 in the previous year. Remember, this is gross receipt, whatever the organization received in the, in the previous year. And uh, the organization made uh, those uh, $201,000 in gross receipt um, or more. And the organization uh, probably, or the organization has more than $500,000 in assets. So you have to fill this and submit this. And, uh, and of course, uh, you can ask for an extension to, to submit this. Uh, you, you can have some, some penalties uh, also to, uh, for not fulfilling this. Uh, you can have the sister organization groups also fulfilling with you. You also have another form that is a 990T for taxes, remember. 990T is about taxes. Uh, is to report any uh, any uh, gross income that you receive more than one thousand dollars in gross income. This is the time for you to report uh, the unrelated business and to pay for taxes. It's unrelated business and paying for taxes. Remember that you need to pay for those taxes and you need to be able to, uh, to pay the taxes. I don't think that we have enough time for, for uh, stopping for, for an exercise. Here is a, the, the, the key uh, elements for the form. What I'm gonna do is, is leave like 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, the, the 990 form, you have a summary. Uh, something that has been changing over the time is the need for uh, an official to, uh, to sign the form. So it needs to be official from the organization to compromise the organization in terms of liability. Uh, you, all the service and programs that you accomplish, the objective, how, how much to invest, uh, invested in each one of these programs, the income and the, and the expenditures. Uh, and also uh, the, the compliance and uh, uh, the different management and governance of all the members of your board, all the key uh, uh, people that work in your organization, key staff, how much are you paying for everyone? Are you paying to the members of the board? Are you compensating? Who is the one who's receiving more compensation? Uh, the statement of revenues, your budget, your revenue, uh, your expenditures, your balance sheet. If you make more than $250,000, you need to include a balance sheet and, uh, and the reconciliation of the asset and of course, the reporting of the financial.
one of the things that you have to have in mind, if you have a, a museum and you have a, a coffee shop in the museum, not related directly to the museum, or you have some activities that uh, you are making some uh, income from those activities, you have probably a, 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 a food service in, uh, in your nonprofit that is not related to the mission. You have some investment from the nonprofit and receiving uh, money from those investments. Probably you have a, a space that you rent for profit and you receive some income from that, that, that building that you are renting. So you have a, 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 an a unrelated income that you need to report. And this is key because sometimes the organization believe that they are tax exempt, they don't need to uh, pay any taxes, they don't need to report anything. So it is unrelated and you need to pay for that. You need to think about what kind of income you receive. You need to uh, uh, think about uh, how that income is a structure. And one thing that you need to have in mind with unrelated uh, uh, business income is the structure of your organization. Because suddenly you begin to operate as a support profit and receive income from different activities. Maybe you are providing some advisory uh, service to other organizations that is not related to your uh, mission or you never adjust your mission. If you figure out that your organization is, uh, is doing something else and suddenly uh, that unrelated uh, business income comprised substantial portion of your uh, income that can be a problem. You can lose your status. There is not a clear, clear rule. There are several cases, court cases. Normally, the, 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 the recommendation is try to have less than 20% of your income with unrelated uh, business income. There are some exclusions. I include the exclusions here. Uh, some clothing stores uh, in terms of, of, uh, of operating in community. Uh, uh, when you donate uh, uh, to these clothing stores and the clothing store generates some revenues for the nonprofit, some trade shows, some bingo, uh, the dividends, uh, uh, interest. Uh, you have several, several things there that uh, can be uh, not and, and it's evaluating case by case. Then you have some uh, opportunities also to create a subsidiary. If your problem is that you are generating more and more unrelated income, my advice is for you to also create your own pro for profit, control it by the nonprofit. So the nonprofit can control a for profit, and that's the for profit in charge of, of the business activity. So you can have a subsidiary an alternate profit, but you can have a subsidiary in terms of a for-profit and you can have a hybrid model. And that has some advantage because you can operate with a legally separated a structure, but in one single board, and you can have the control from the nonprofit to the for-profit. And that's the beauty of the hybrid model. There are some people that criticize the hybrid model. There are some challenge, there are some advantage, but in some cases for innovation process and an organization they are becoming more and more profitable and uh, entering different areas, sometimes it is good to have a different uh, kind of approach. So we're, we're gonna go to the, to the end of the presentation now talking a little bit about compliance and uh, the, 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 uh, the priority in terms of compliance, in terms of the federal, a state and local levels is self-regulation, having governance and governance structure, good practice. Uh, there's not a lot of, 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 of rules of uh, legal structure uh, and, and the need of compliance. 
the law governing the, the, the nonprofit sector comes from state, from federal first. Uh, uh, principally, so is, is federal, but then you have the state uh, that's uh, where you're going to ha have a, a bunch of, of, of rules, uh, uh, how to operate and uh, how to deal with the charity, how to deal with fundraising. You have uh, IRS, uh, you also so fulfill, I already say that, labor laws and other laws. Uh, you have uh, uh, federal law laws that apply to the tax exemption, the federal laws that apply to you as a corporation, because it's a corporation, it's a, it's a, a, a non-profit, corporation, tax exempt, but it's a corporation. Then uh, uh, you have some limitations in terms of if you are 501c3, you are a foundation, you are a public charity, you are not allowed to uh, a, a mayor a, a, a lobby activity or advocacy, and it has been some changes. Uh, the Congress has been more active, and remember the case of the Red Cross. The Congress sent directly a letter to the Red Cross to ask for uh, information about the activities of the Red Cross, and the, the Red Cross uh, need to engage directly with the Congress. The Congress is, has been more and more active in terms of evaluating the sector in, in, and the sector at the same time to prevent new rules, new legislation has been more open to self-regulation, to create ways for the organizations to have more monitoring, to evaluate the governance, to improve the sector. Uh, there are some uh, a, a different uh, organization, watchdogs, oversight group, they have been recommending uh, best practices, they have been engaging in, in recommending how the organization need to be more uh, uh, effective in terms of how they operate. In terms of the legislation that you need to be aware, one is the Savoyans Oxley Act, or SOX, we call this SOX. It's a it's a it's a law not created by, by uh, not created specifically to the nonprofit sector. It is not clear that it's for the nonprofit sector. Supposed to apply for the nonprofit sector because they are uh, nonprofits are corporations too. But from the source, from the supports, what you need to be aware is two specific uh, 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 rules uh, provisions. Uh, one is a is a document retention that you need to have a policy in place on how you're going to keep the uh, uh, crucial information, the receive, the, 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 the information uh, that is a key in terms of, of how you uh, manage the organization and maintain uh, those uh, uh, files. And, and if you fail to maintain uh, and, and the receive, to maintain the information, and you destroy that, you can face up to 10, uh, 20 years in jail. So you have to maintain that. You have to have a policy that establishes how many years are you going to maintain those documents, that you're going to have a, 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 a copies of the document, you're going to have the files online. Uh, you need to have that policy. And the second uh, uh, re, uh, re rule that applies directly to the nonprofit sector is the whistleblower provision, is that you need to uh, protect any individual that provide information uh, to the law enforcement about the activities of your organization. And you cannot uh, implement any retaliation. And normally you need to have that policy. Doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, include specifically that you have to have that policy, but their recommendation is you need to have that policy in the, in the organization. There are other laws that apply. It's going to be in this presentation, the Federal Volunteer Protection uh, Law, the Federal Tax Cut and Jobs Act in uh, 2017 that changed, the structure and change, the, some of the uh, 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 benefits from our sector, uh, the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, the Pension Protection Act. There are several laws that you need to uh, uh, be aware and in uh, and, and, and keeping track of those laws. Then you have the state level uh, uh, regulations. Normally, you have the Attorney General oversight. Uh, there's a, not a single uh, uh, rule applied in all the states. They have been trying to create standardization among the different states, but that's not the case. There are several states uh, with different kind of rules. So you have to be 
aware of those rules and figure out how those rules apply to a specific case, how the attorney general in a specific case uh, act. There's a document that's really good that is a study and report from the central nonprofit uh, uh, from the Urban Institute that includes some of the national uh, a, a review of each state and how each state operate and, and, and found how each uh, state include different kind of rules, how the, the jurisdiction include different uh, structures there in terms of how they monitor the, the nonprofit, how they enforce the, the sanctions, how they enforce the application of those rules. And there are different states with different le legislations, with different rules. In some states, you have the Sunshine Act uh, that uh, requires the board meetings to be public if you receive uh, public funding. There are different. There are some uh, states that require that uh, uh, give uh, directly the board member if uh, you prove the duty of care, uh, you are not uh, liable for the activities of the nonprofit. You have uh, different uh, laws and you have also a uh, different state, different laws, and, and also good practice. They have been published uh, by several think tanks and uh, watchdog organizations. So this is the, 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 the end of the, of the presentation. Now I'm gonna open uh, for Q&A. Uh, and uh, we can spend the, the, the last minutes answering some questions directly or uh, if you send your question to the, to the chat. For uh, personal experience, is it helpful to have a lawyer? Uh, yes, sometimes when you talk about a small organization that makes less than $50,000, uh, paying for uh, the service of uh, of an expert takes uh, takes uh, a, a lot of the assets from the organization, and uh, sometimes it's good in terms of the financial documents to have somebody who contribute with the system with the financial. It just if you don't have the funds available. Uh, you don't need it. So nobody requires that you uh, uh, will need to include an attorney, a lawyer in, uh, in the application process. Nobody requires that you need to have an accountant reviewing your budget and the financial documents. It is a good uh, practice and more with a uh, bigger organization, but it's not mandatory. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for for your uh, uh, and and uh, sorry there, there was uh, some moment of, of uh, some lapsus in the in the presentation but you're gonna have the full uh, the full PowerPoint presentation that include all the information that include all the 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 the, the requirements and uh, it's gonna be uh, available for all of you. Uh, that that will uh, help you in the case of, of uh, if you if you uh, think about applying if you think about incorporating a nonprofit in the future and remember we are here for you too uh, here uh, the nonprofit management at, at SDS we're here for you uh, sometimes we get calls from some students from prospect students from alumni from uh, asking about information and asking about process and uh, I, in, in my case I'm always there for you and uh, I think that that's uh, all, all the professors all the, the instructors and all the, 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 the team is, is there for you uh, it has been an honor for me to be here with you today Today to share some of the information and also to engage in this uh, uh, presentation and give you some some of the advice, uh, some of the tools, and uh, some key information that will help you to move forward. Uh, doesn't matter if you have uh, 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 the the idea of creating a nonprofit now or in the future, but it's good to know. And some some uh, things about uh, 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 fulfilling the requirement, uh, uh, the legal standards that you need to have in mind is important for the organization. It's important to plan ahead. It's important to have all this information available uh, for you. In in uh, in name uh, of the of the team. Uh, our team has been very active uh, supporting uh, this presentation uh, and uh, I hope that you will be able to uh, follow us, to continue the engagement and to participate 
and uh, in the next session that we have uh, that we have been planning for you. Uh, this initial one was just about starting the nonprofit, but uh, for sure, governance is going to be a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, fundraising now is getting more complex. Uh, you will learn a lot of uh, good tools, and also uh, you will have also a session just with uh, marketing and uh, and also how you're going to communicate the good news storytelling I, I i cannot wait to to participate in that session and and see what uh, we, we can learn from that uh, again uh, thank you for being here thank you for your participation i know there's a saturday and that shows that you have a, 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 a high interest for this sector that you care for this sector and now with the with the covid 19 after this uh, crisis uh, this country needs our sector to be more active in the community to contribute uh, with uh, with the people in need and uh, the people that will need that the sector be more active. Uh, thank you again and uh, have a, a, a good weekend.